book of Philippians, chapter number four, we will finish this book up today, Lord willing. In chapter number four, the first nine verses dealt with don't worry. And we did that last week. And today we really, it's, it's a different approach, but probably the same theme. And that subject today is contentment. Contentment. And I would say don't worry leads to contentment or discontentment leads to worry. So uh, the subject matter today, <clears throat> beginning in verse 10, is uh, the subject of contentment. Uh, Paul makes uh, some uh, interesting statements. In verse number, uh, verse 11 he says, I can accept all things. Verse number 13, he says, I can do all things. In verse 18, he says, I have all things. Perhaps I should say that contentment is not complacency. Contentment is not laziness. Contentment is not escape. And contentment is not false peace. I would think maybe the heart of the matter would be verse 11, where Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Contentment, not worrying, is a learned habit. I would take that a little farther to say it is not a natural, physical response. I, I think that is something we need the help of the Lord with. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I think the society in which we live today with our modern conveniences, and I probably am referring particularly to the television, where there's always something new being promoted, always something bigger, <clears throat> always something better. Uh, it probably makes it a little more difficult for our society uh, to be content. But Paul said he had to learn it. Now, Think about the Apostle Paul. He, was, he wasn't anybody's slouch. He was a great Christian. But even he had to learn contentment. And uh, he went through many, many uh, varied experiences to get to that place. So uh, he learned by experience. And content means... Uh, Contained or self-sufficient. Whatever your condition is, uh, you accept the fact that uh, that is your position in Christ. And I really think it's about the only way that you can ever really be content in your situation and not fret and not worry is uh, to understand that our lives are in God's hands. Early this morning uh, I studied Psalms 105 where the writer, who by the way isn't named, reviews the entire history of Israel in about 40 verses. It's a succulent chapter. And all the very things that they went through from the time that Moses led them out of Egypt 
to the time of the writing of that psalm, the psalm, the psalmist lists detail after detail after detail of their national life, and he credits God for it. So I think uh, contentment, uh, contained, self-sufficient, can only be <clears throat> uh, in Christ. And the Lord knows that, and he, and he expects that. So, first of all, uh, as is my uh, style, I want to walk you through verse 10 to the end of the chapter. And we'll make a few observations, and then I'll approach it uh, from another different angle, time permitting. The subject is victory over anxious care uh, and uh, trusting in the Lord. Paul said, uh, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Uh, and remind you, he's in prison for preaching. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. The word rejoice is the key word here. That now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Uh, Paul had not heard from this church in a while. Uh, they were themselves in a very difficult persecution type situation where they were not able to minister <clears throat> to the Apostle Paul. But finally, uh, the care package arrives uh, through another servant in the church. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last he wasn't upset <clears throat> that the check didn't come in the mail, so to speak, in modern terminology, as it was needed or he hoped for. He was instead rejoicing that finally there is some help. That's a good attitude. Instead of moaning about what didn't happen, Paul rejoiced for what did. Needed lesson for our society, amen? Needed lesson for me. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last, in other words, there had been a long dry spell, your care of me hath flourished again. And Paul understood when you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Paul understood that the church wanted to help him, but just couldn't. I think that's a good thing for us to remember. Paul said, I know you wanted to. I know you were careful or full of care. I, I, I know that you were worried about me, but you just couldn't. Sometimes God accepts the intent for the real thing. For example, David desperately wanted to build the temple at Jerusalem, but God said no. And God told him he accepted his desire for the real thing. Sometimes we want to do something and we either can't or it isn't God's will or both or even something else. But God, who sees the heart, accepts the desire for the real thing. So they lacked opportunity. They were careful, but you lacked opportunity. Sometimes we want to do something, just, just can't, just, just doesn't work out. When I was young, I used to go to a lot of preachers' meetings. Well, there was always a love offering, a fundraiser, and through the years I have learned to mistrust that and, and just flat not do it. They would always take, uh, how many of you will send a check for so much uh, in six months? Da, da, da. And I finally, I, finally, I finally grew up and I, I got to why I just don't do that because I would promise and, and then the ability wasn't there to do it. And so finally it dawned on me, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. And that's true, I shouldn't have been doing that. And so I, I just don't do that anymore. I don't make promises in the future. If I've got it, you can have it. If I don't got it, you can't have it. And God understands that. We need to operate that way. 
sometimes the desire is there, but the opportunity is not. God wants us to live where we are for the moment. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, in whatsoever state I am, to be content. Not that I speak in respect of want. Paul did not get in a frenzy in his life when he was in a time of need. He learned not uh, to worry about the wants. But even in times of want, to be <coughs> content. Paul had that kind of a confidence in God. Paul thought, well, God knows I really need this. Well, I think I really need this. But if it doesn't come, I accept that God apparently had a better plan or something else. Not that I speak in respect of one. Paul, Paul you're not going to find anywhere where he contacted churches and said, I've just got to have this thing. Yet. This, this, I'm doing what I want. He never did that. Matter of fact, when he got to the Corinth church, he didn't have anything. He got a job until the times got better. But he did learn through hard times to be content, to be calm, to rest in the Lord. Uh, verse 12, I know both how to be abased. Paul said, I have done without lots of times. I know what it's like to do without. Then he said, I know how to abound. Paul said, I, I've gone through times where I had plenty. <clears throat> everywhere and in all things. Everywhere he has been and is and will be. In all things. All circumstances, he is instructed by who? The Lord. Both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound, have plenty, and suffer need, not have enough. The underlying thought there is his absolute confidence in the Lord. Because of the uh, uh, plenteousness of our society, we, we have a hard time doing without. We really do. Uh, and, and matter of fact, most people even think that it's wrong to do without. That never was Paul's theology. You know, the Word of Faith movement churches, they are real big about, well, if you don't have it, it's because you don't have any faith. Ask God for it. Well, that may sound spiritual, but it's not. The fact is, folks, and most of us, especially when we were young, uh, there were times we just did without. There were just times you were wondering, I've got this bill to pay, and then where's the grocery money coming from? And if I pay the rent, then where am I going to get some money to go to get some gas so I can go to work next week? You know, we've younger years we had all that. God knows all about that. Solomon talked about this. He said, uh, God tempers our, <clears throat> our plenty of times with our empty times. And God does that so that we'll find nothing after us and we'll learn to trust the Lord. And Paul does that. We all survive the bad times. Amen. We all survive the good times. Amen. Now, how? Well, the answer is verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, first of all, he didn't say, I can handle this. I got this. He didn't say that. I can do all things through Christ. And what, what does the Lord do? For us, that enables us to, to survive the bad times. He strengthens us. I can, we can do all things through Christ, which is our strength. Notwithstanding, having 
expressed his theology of contentment, notwithstanding, in other words, in spite of everything, ye have done well that ye did communicate with my affliction. So, folks, anytime we have the opportunity to help someone, it's good. You've done well. It's good to share of our means uh, with others. <clears throat> uh, Matthew Henry, in his commentary on uh, uh, Matthew 6, uh, was pretty strong in his theology that uh, if you have more than you need, there must be somebody God wants you to help. <clears throat> now, I understand there has to be a balance. I understand that. But uh, notwithstanding you have done well, we do well when we help others, that you did communicate or give with my affliction. It's good to help people in trouble when we can. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, the Philippian church uh, was maybe his best work. He started it early in his ministry, and for many years that church carried on, and it did good, and was the most consistent helper of the Apostle Paul. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Uh, so there were a lot of times the only help Paul ever got was from the uh, church at Philippi. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Now, here's something very good. Not because I desire a gift. There were times when Paul was in dire straits, needing clothing and fooding, food. But that was not his main motivation. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He was appreciative of the gift, but he said, folks, uh, you're helping me is fruit, spiritual fruit, to your account. Um, that's a good spirit. That's a good attitude. So in verse 18, but I have all and abound, I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Let me pause there and remind us about something that I've told you before. Paul was in prison, and uh, those prisons were not like prisons today. You get three square meals, you get a comfortable bed, you get a TV room, a work room, and da 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 um, those, those early days, those prisons were terrible places. Uh, your own family had to support you and take care of you and bring you stuff even though you were in prison. Uh, the government didn't do anything, which probably should remind us that even though our government today has many, many problems and pitfalls, we still are living under the most benevolent government in human history. Amen. So, I have all and abound. I am full, having received over Prophetitis the things which were sent from you. The church took good care of him. An odor of a sweet smell. Uh, that, I don't have time to get into that, don't want to get into that, but that goes back to the Old Testament when there were some sweet spicy smelling uh, sacrifices that were offered up to God and God accepted them as a sweet uh, sacrifice and so that's what uh, 
uh, he's meaning here. He said, you've done a wonderful thing, which is a, a well-pleasing, acceptable to God, what you have done. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, well, acceptable, well, pleasing to God. Now, I want you to notice something. The church did not give out of their abundance. It's not what it says. The church gave out of a sacrifice. Even what the church did was a sacrifice. Acceptable, well, pleasing to God. Here's a very grateful man confined, so thankful that a package with a man came from the church of Philippi to meet his, really what you and I would consider our extremely most basic needs, food and clothing and maybe a little something to keep him warm. And Paul understood this didn't come out of their abundance. Paul understood this was also uh, a sacrifice on the part of the church. So Paul makes them a promise, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Luke 6 38 says, Given it shall be given you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into, the, into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. We are never losers for being good to God's people. We are never losers for being good to the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so Paul says, not only thanks him, but he reminds him that God will supply all your need. Now, I do want you to, again, zero in on that word for a minute, but my God shall supply. He doesn't say everything you want. I think we all want stuff we probably don't need. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting stuff that, are, that you don't need if, if you can pay for it. And if you won't use it against God. I'm not one of these, you know, there's nowhere in the Bible, Catholic Church is wrong, there's nowhere in the Bible about an oath of poverty. But the Bible does talk about living in our means. And God promises to supply <clears throat> our needs. And where's all this stuff coming from? According to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 32, I love that verse. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with them also freely give us all things? Not everything you want, but God has promised to take care of you, all of us. He's, he's promised to take care of us on our journey through this life. And so, uh, contentment. Paul... Uh, knew what that was. So, uh, before I get to those closing verses, how do you get there? Contentment. Uh, you don't worry, you're content, you're happy with what you have, and where, where, where you are. Well, I think there are uh, three or four principles out of this text that we need to look at. Confid number one, confidence in the overruling providence of God. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that not the last you care for me at first again when you also care for what you lacked opportunity. But I rejoice in the Lord. Confidence in the overruling providence of God. I mentioned Psalms 105 a few minutes ago. If you have some time this afternoon, it's not going to be a good day to be outside. Find you a little quiet spot in your house somewhere and sit down and just slowly read Psalms 105. 
the, the, the psalmist credits God for everything that he did in the life of that nation. From the great big miracles in Egypt to the least little ray of sunshine and the moon at night and everything else. The psalmist credits God. What is providence? The working of God in advance to arrange circumstances and situations to the fulfilling of his own purposes. Let me read that again. Providence is the working of God in advance to arrange circumstances and situations to the fulfilling of his own purposes. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Psalms 139, the first 10 verses, I won't take time to read them because our time is getting short. God knows and ordains every breath you breathe, every step you take every thought you think, every place you go. That's the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Psalm 32, eight, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shouldest go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Confidence in God. Then there is a, a second principle. And that is, uh, Paul, had an Paul had an unfailing confidence in the power of God. Verse 11 to 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in what sort of state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed to be full and to be hungry to abound to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Paul understood and believed to the bone marrow of his body that whatever God's power would take care of the situation. Spiritual and yes all other contentment comes from the power of God within. Do not look at the world without for your contentment. It's not there. It's in here by the power of God. Uh, instructed, verse 12, means initiated into the secret of God. Paul, Paul said, I, I'm instructed by God. That means to be initiated into the secret of God. In difficult times, we must draw on the power of God. Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. The unfailing power of God. And then, number three, Paul had the absolute confidence in the unchanging promise of God. But my God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, Moses had that in Psalms 90. And in Psalms 91, God said, If you will trust me, I will take good care of you even to your old age. That's what he said in Psalms 91. Verse 14 through 16. There came a time when God said to Abraham, offer up your son. And yet he was the only heir which God had promised. And Abraham just didn't understand. And finally Abraham said, well, I'm going to obey God because God is able even to raise him from the dead if that's what he wants to do. That's an unchanging confidence in God. So, in conclusion, 
how to keep the joy in your life, how to keep from worrying, how to be content, uh, how uh, not to fret. Number one, surrender your mind to the Lord at the beginning of each day. Such a simple principle, but folks, start your day with the Lord. Give yourself and your day to the Lord. God's not asleep. God is not on vacation. Honor the Lord at the beginning of the day, and He will lead you through it. Number two, let the Holy Spirit renew your mind through the Word daily. You want to set yourself up for a bad day? If you're a Christian, you want to set yourself up for a bad day? Start without God. Start without the Word. Start without prayer. It's a mistake. Let the Holy Spirit renew your mind through the Word. Number three, uh, in prayer, ask God to help you for the day. Give your all to the Lord. Give yourself up as you start the day. Give yourself up to God. Let Him do what it is that needs to be done for the day. Number four, do you suffer a relapse? Confess it immediately. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, relapse, confess it. Number five, guard what goes in your mind. Guard what goes in your mind. Job said, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And then let me give you one more. Number six. Use your seasons of joy and contentment and calm to share Christ with others. You'll be a ship calm on a terribly tumultuous sea of fretful humanity. And people will notice. And people will want to know what your secret is. Amen? We'll stop there. That's the book of Philippians. I hope that you have enjoyed it.